انا بحب الالبو جوينت وبعتقد ان الالبو جوينت از ذا موست امبورتنت جوينت ذا ابر ليف وده نوع من البايس وبايس اكتر للابر ليف بالمناسبه يعني الرجلين بتعمل ايه بتعمل كوموشن صح بس الابر ليف از ذا افكتور اللي بقى عندي اي حاجه لو تيجي تفكر كده لو لا قدر الله يعني جيت امبلوي واحد فاقد رجليه واحد فاقد ايديه مين اللي تلاقيه في مشكله اكبر في الامبلويمنت بتاعه طبعا فاقد ايديه بيلاقي يعني بيبقى اصعب في ايجاد وظيفه له ف دراعي ده المولى سبحانه وتعالى اقامه عشان اتعامل مع العالم الالبو جوينت كل مفصل في كت في في, في الابر ليم لو فاليو لو دور لو دور مختلف ماي البو جوينت از ماي ابروكسيميتر اند ماي سيبريتر يودني شيء ويقصي ات برينجز ذا وورلد تو يو اند بوشز ذا وورلد اواي الشولدر از ذا بوزيشنر اوف ذا ابر ليم اوكي والافكتور بيعتمد if my hand is holding something in a power grip the effector is my wrist ماسك شاكوش بدق اوكي but if i'm using my fingers in what's known as a precision grip my position is my wrist okay the worst functional outcome is when you lose your elbow range of motion imagine yourself not moving your glenohumeral joint well there's a lot of compensation around that but the worst thing to lose would be your elbow flexion extension range So I hope I can give you an idea about the anatomical design of the elbow, how this, is, this design is adapted to the function, and the normal range of motion function, as well as the stabilizers of the elbow, and how this is matched with biomechanics. Um, You have to know that as you get older, okay, your upper limbs are more liable to become weight-bearing. Oh, sorry. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Okay, cursor at computer, okay. Stop, she's walking. She's walking. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's the mouse. Okay. So it becomes weight bearing. Okay. It becomes weight bearing as you get older. Why does it become weight bearing? Because, because you probably are expected to use a crutch, to use a cane, to use your upper limbs to get off a chair. Okay? get off, off and on the toilet seat. So as you get older, you are expected to put more weight on your upper limbs. And the added value of an elbow is rotation. Some rotation comes from my shoulder, but most of daily activity rotation comes from my elbow, my forearm operation supination movement. The range of motion is from zero to 150 degrees of flexion, but the functional range of motion is from 30 to 130, till I can reach my mouth. Okay? <coughs> While pronation of supination is between 80 and 85 degrees, 85 degrees of pronation, 80 degrees of pronation, but, but 
the, uh, the function range is about 45 degrees on each side. The elbow is composed of three joints, an ulnar humeral joint, a radial humeral joint, and a proximal radial ulnar joint. The ulnar humeral joint is a modified hinge of third class lever and allows only one degree of movement, which is flexion extension, while the, the proximal radial humeral joint is a pivot joint as well as a proximal radial ulnar joint. The distal, hum distal humerus is composed of three um, arches, okay? We call it sometimes a tie arch. You have a lateral column and a tie arch in a medial column and a tie arch in between. The tie arch is composed of, on the lateral column, the lateral epicondyle and the capitulum, while the trochlea is in the middle of the tie arch and the medial part of the medial column, this part of the medial column, is just the medial epicondyle. So it's not articular. It's extra articular. Normally, we have a small angle between the, the, capitu the long axis of the humerus and the axis of the elbow joint. This angle varies from eight, 4 to 8 degrees. And this 4 to 8 degrees is um, known as the carrying angle. And this, in this drawing there, shows you that the, uh, this allows you to carry weights along the axis of the forearm without hitting the rest of your body. And um, what do you think? Do females have a higher carrying angle than males? Who believes that females have a higher carrying angle. Okay. They do have a higher carrying angle. You know why? They have a wider hip, so they need a wider carrying angle so that they don't carry things on their forearms, they don't hit their bodies. Okay? So, also from the design, the anterior surface of your humerus is 40 degrees angulated to the long axis of the humerus. And this gives you the added advantage of having a flexion range, not an extension range. Okay? So your full extension is with your arm flat, and your function goes anteriorly. Proximal ulna, there's a notch, it's 180 degrees. Um, it coincides with your trochlea and it is angulated 30 degrees to the, the long axis of the shaft of the humerus. This anterior translation, the 30 degrees angulation, the coronoid fossa in front and the olecranian fossa in the back allows the, the humerus to move from full extension to full flexion without impingement. If it was straight, if it was straight, not angulated to the 40 degrees, we probably would get, would get a 90 degree bend, but the 40 degrees plus the 30 degrees of angulation between the, the, the line joining the capitulum, the, the, the tip of the and the coronoid, we get our 150 degrees of flexion, which is almost your 90 degrees plus your 70, your, 30, your, your 40 degrees plus your 30 degrees. Okay? So to regain forward flexion, you need this angulation and you need the normal anatomical configuration of your proximal ulna. What about stability of the elbow? The elbow is quite stable actually. And this depends, is a combination of bony, ligamentous, and dynamic muscular stabilizers. We call it the ring theory or the mode theory 
in the ring theory, you've got anterior stabilizers, which are your coronoid is a bony, bony stabilizer, a static soft tissue anterior capsule, and a dynamic brachialis muscle. While on the back, you've got your cranial fossa, your posterior capsule, and your triceps. And on the medial side, you've got your medial collateral ligament and your, med uh, your, your coronoid process and medial epicondyle with the medial uh, as a bony stabilizer. And on the lateral side, you've got your radial head against your capitillum and your lateral collateral ligament complex. Um, you could see that there's a groove in the center of your trochlea to accommodate the ridge in the center of your proximal ulna, and this adds bony stability. While your coronoid goes deep into a coronoid fossa and is divided into two major parts. An interior part, which is responsible for your anteroposterior stability, okay, and a smallish anteromedial facet, which re receives the anterior or anterior oblique bundle of your medial collateral ligament and would be responsible for your medial elbow stability. What about our elbow flexors? We've got two elbow flexors. Biceps brachii, okay, and we've got our brachialis. The brachialis is the main flexor of the elbow throughout the range of motion, okay? And it is twice as strong as, your, as the extensors, hopefully. While your biceps mainly works as a flexor when the arm is in supination. It is less, it's not effective while your arm is in pronation, okay? But in compensation, when your arm is pronated, your flexor pronator mass assists further in elbow flexion. So when I'm flexing in supination, it's mainly biceps and brachialis. When I'm flexing in pronation, it's mainly brachialis and flexor pronator mass. What about our elbow extensors? Our elbow extensors, we've got a long head of triceps, which does insert in the back of the new humeral joint, so it, it is biarticular and would extend the elbow effectively, especially with, with the shoulder flexed. The main flexor is the medial horse, is the medial head, which is the workhorse for elbow flexion, while uh, while uh, the lateral head is re relatively inactive except against marked resistance. The proximal radius, 75% of the girth of our radial head articulates with the proximal ulna, in our proximal radial ulna joint. And the 25% which the, the the, radial the, the part of the radial head that does not articulate with the proximal ulna, we call it the bare area. And this is, this is the area where you could put your plates in and metalware in without hitting your ulna. And usually, clinically, we say that this bare area is identical between the radial styloid and the Lister's tubercle. Okay. Um, you can see here, that as the forearm rotates, it's uh, around the annular ligament, it, it's only in touch with, with, uh, with, with a smaller percent, 67 percent actually, with the proximal ulna, but only the last 25 percent, which is almost between the Lister's tubercle and radius thyroid. Okay, what about our ligaments? The ligaments of the elbow has actually seen quite a few uh, conceptual changes, okay? 
It's not been till 1997 that we identified what's known as the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the most posterior part of your lateral collateral ligament. It does directly insert into your proximal ulna and is the main stabilizer of the proximal ulna into one the main soft tissue stabilizer for with varus okay and you've got your radial collateral lig uh, lateral ligament and your ulnar collateral ligament your annular ligament and your accessory lat uh, accessory lateral collateral ligament which is this part so this is the main bit and it's actually uh, inserts just proximal and posterior to your annular ligament. If you take the radial head out with the annular ligament, you could identify it as a very strong and stout structure on the posterolateral aspect of your ulna. Okay. Okay. And when we reconstruct that, we, we, we try to mimic that when doing uh, lateral collateral ligament reconstruction with a tendon graft going through the lateral epicondyle and through the proximal ulna. And this is how it looks like with these two drill holes in the proximal ulna when you do that. What about your medial component? We've got the anterior bundle or anterior oblique bundle, which is, which is inserts in the anteromedial facet of the uh, coronary process. You've got your posterior oblique and your transverse bundle. Um, this is how it looks in MRI, and it's a main resistant to vulgus stress. When we got postromedial varus rotational instability, we find this picture commonly in which the anteromedial facet, this area here, is avulsed with a part of the medial collateral ligament, and this needs to be fixed to achieve elbow stability, whether by screws or a mini plate in place. So we went through the, the ring concept before, but um, when there is a pure dislocation, this is a pure soft tissue injury, all the static stabilizers and maybe part of the dynamic stabilizers are off, but this is a pure dislocation. This is less common than having uh, um, a bony and ligamentous disruption, in which can be a single column like posterior dislocation of the elbow or medial, uh, postromedial varus rotary instability, or it can be a complex lesion like this one. This complex lesion, you've got a fracture of your radial head and you've got a fracture of your uh, coronoid process and you've got a dislocation of the elbow. What do we call that? And why is it called terrible triad? Because if you don't, if you're not aware of the three components, of the minimum three components of a terrible triad, you probably will have this elbow dislocate once, twice, and twice. So multiple common dislocation is a terrible triad. Terrible triad, you've got your coronary process lost, You've got your, your lateral uh, collateral ligament lost, and you've got your radial head lost, and you might have a medial collateral ligament lost. So to reconstruct that, you, you have to repair your coronoid process, your radial head, your lateral collateral ligament, especially your lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and then assess your medial collateral ligament. If it needs reconstruction, you have to reconstruct that, and this is how we reconstruct it that's complex, radial head and coronoid, then we go for the medial collateral ligament. And you might or might not have an intact medial collateral ligament. So, in conclusion, stability of the elbow depends on soft tissue, stabilizers, capsule static, depends on muscle stability, especially in anthroposterior plane, as well as the bony stability. Um, 
most of the loads of the elbow are transmitted through the radial head in full extension, but, but as extension decreases, more of the other component becomes, becomes uh, the load-bearing part of the elbow. In full extension, 40% is ulnohumeral and 60% is radiohumeral, while in full flexion, ulnohumeral might go to up to 80%. Uh, one of the controversies is how do you fix the distal humerus? Double plating, one plate. Now we are 100% solidly sure that we cannot fix proximal distal humerus without going to double plating. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And there's also controversy whether to go parallel or, 100 or perpendicular plates. There's, there's some little biomechanical uh, studies showing that parallel plating has, has some biomechanical um, advantage, although not, nothing clinically apparent. Elbow replacements are linked or unlinked. Um, this is a very interesting part. If you fuse an elbow, if you're going to fuse one elbow, you do it 90 degrees, but if you're going to fuse both elbows, you have to have one on the mouth and one on the genitalia, which would probably be right or left. And so you use one at 70 degrees, at 65 degrees, and the other at 110. This is how important your elbows is to life. So my take home message to you is the range of motion, function is 30 to 130, 45 degrees, pronation, supination, forces at the elbow are huge because the muscles flexing and extending the elbow are fixed very close to the elbow joint. And there's an inherent bony stability. Be quite aware of the terrible triangle. Thank you so much.